Welcome to Just Stories, we hope you enjoy the story. The Tripoli Tan War, America vs. North African Pirates, by Just Stories. Chapter 1, The Road to War, America's Early Encounters with North African Pirates. Ahoy there, mateys. Welcome aboard this journey back in time to explore the early encounters between America and the notorious North African Pirates. To understand the Tripoli Tan War, we must first set the scene by examining the long history of piracy in the Mediterranean. For centuries, pirates from the North African states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli had been attacking ships from European nations, seizing cargo and capturing sailors to be sold into slavery. These pirates, known as the Barbary Corsairs, were a formidable force with a fearsome reputation. As America began to expand its trade and shipping routes beyond the Atlantic, it too became a target for the Barbary pirates. In the late 1700s, American merchants began reporting incidents of piracy in the Mediterranean, leading to a series of diplomatic efforts to secure safe passage and trade agreements with the North African states. These efforts, however, were largely unsuccessful, as the Barbary rulers demanded exorbitant tributes in exchange for allowing American ships to sail without fear of attack. One of the most notable figures in America's early efforts to deal with the Barbary pirates was Thomas Jefferson, who was serving as the U.S. ambassador to France in the late 1700s. In a letter to John Jay in 1786, Jefferson lamented the situation, writing, It will be more easy to raise ships and men to fight these pirates into reason than money to bribe them. Despite Jefferson's pessimism, diplomatic efforts continued for several more years, culminating in the Treaty of Tripoli in 1796, which established a payment of $18,000 per year in exchange for safe passage for American ships. However, by the turn of the century, the situation had deteriorated once again, with the North African states increasing their demands for tribute and attacking American ships with greater frequency. In response, President Jefferson began to consider more aggressive options, including the possibility of using military force against the Barbary states. This decision was not without controversy, as many in Congress and the public were skeptical of the idea of engaging in a conflict so far from home. Nevertheless, Jefferson remained convinced that military action was necessary to protect American interests and put an end to the piracy crisis. And so, as we shall see in the next chapter, the United States began to prepare for war, building a powerful navy to take on the Barbary Corsairs and defend American trade in the Mediterranean. But before we dive into the conflict itself, it is important to understand the historical context that led to America's fateful decision to go to war against the pirates of Tripoli. So batten down the hatches, ye scallywags, and prepare for the adventure of a lifetime as we explore the Tripoli Tan War, a pivotal moment in America's early history on the high seas. Chapter 2, Jefferson's Dilemmas The Decision to Go to War Welcome back, shipmates. In our last chapter, we explored the history of piracy in the Mediterranean and America's early attempts to deal with the Barbary Corsairs. In this chapter, we'll dive into the internal debates within the Jefferson administration about how to respond to the escalating piracy crisis. As we mentioned before, President Jefferson had become convinced that military action was necessary to put an end to the Barbary piracy. However, not everyone in his administration was on board with the idea. Secretary of State James Madison, in particular, was skeptical of the notion that war was the best way to deal with the situation. Madison argued that the cost of building a navy and waging a foreign war would be too high for the young United States, both in terms of money and manpower. He also worried about the potential repercussions of engaging in a conflict so far from home, including the risk of retaliation from other European powers with interests in the Mediterranean. Jefferson, however, was convinced that the piracy crisis could not be solved through diplomacy alone. He saw military action as not only a means of protecting American trade and shipping, but also as a way of asserting America's standing as a world power. Another factor that played into Jefferson's decision was the political climate of the time. The Federalist Party, which had been in power during the previous administration, had been critical of Jefferson's efforts to negotiate with the Barbary states, arguing that it was a sign of weakness. 
By taking a more aggressive stance, Jefferson hoped to win over some of his critics and bolster his own political standing. Despite the reservations of some of his advisors, Jefferson ultimately decided to pursue military action against the Barbary pirates. He began building up the U.S. Navy's Mediterranean squadron, including the construction of six new frigates specifically designed for combat in the waters off the coast of North Africa. As preparations for war continued, Jefferson faced increasing pressure from Congress to act decisively. In December 1801, he delivered a message to Congress outlining the situation and calling for the authorization of military force. Congress approved the measure, and on May 10, 1802, the United States declared war on Tripoli. Jefferson's decision to go to war was not without controversy, and the conflict would prove to be a long and difficult one. However, it marked a significant turning point in America's relationship with the Barbary states and set the stage for future American engagement in the Mediterranean and beyond. In our next chapter, we'll explore the first engagements of the Tripolitan War, including the famous battles of the USS Philadelphia and the USS Enterprise. So batten down the hatches and prepare for the action to come. Chapter 3, Showdown in Tripoli, the First Barbary War. Ahoy, me hearties! In our last chapter, we explored the decision-making process that led President Jefferson to declare war on the Barbary state of Tripoli. In this chapter, we'll dive into the first engagements of the conflict, including the famous battles of the USS Philadelphia and the USS Enterprise. The USS Philadelphia, under the command of Captain William Bainbridge, was one of the six new frigates commissioned by Jefferson for the Mediterranean Squadron. In October 1803, while pursuing a Tripoli tan ship, the Philadelphia ran aground on a reef off the coast of Tripoli and was captured by the enemy. The loss of the Philadelphia was a major setback for the American forces, as it not only deprived them of one of their most powerful ships, but also gave the Tripoli tans a significant technological advantage, as they were able to steady the frigate's advanced design and armaments. The capture of the Philadelphia also led to a daring mission by Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, who sailed into Tripoli Harbor with a small group of sailors and burned the frigate to prevent it from being used against the Americans. Decatur's successful raid was a morale boost for the U.S. Navy and demonstrated the ingenuity and bravery of American sailors. Meanwhile, another American frigate, the USS Enterprise, was engaged in its own battles against the Tripoli Tans. Under the command of Lieutenant Andrew Sterrett, the Enterprise engaged and defeated two Tripoli Tan ships in August 1801 and went on to capture several more vessels over the course of the conflict. The Enterprise's success was due in part to its superior speed and maneuverability, which allowed it to outmaneuver and outgun the slower and less well-equipped Tripoli Tan ships. Sterrett's leadership and tactical prowess also played a key role in the victories, earning him accolades from his fellow sailors and the American public. After several years of fighting, the Tripoli Tan War finally came to a close in June 1805, when the U.S. Navy successfully blockaded the city of Tripoli and forced the ruler, Yusuf Karamanli, to negotiate a peace treaty. The terms of the treaty included the release of American prisoners and the cessation of tribute payments to the Tripoli Tan state. The First Barbary War was not without its challenges and setbacks, but it marked a significant victory for the United States and demonstrated the country's growing military and diplomatic power on the world stage. In our next chapter, we'll explore the renewal of conflict with the Barbary states in the Second Barbary War and the continued struggles to combat piracy in the Mediterranean and beyond. So hoist the colors and set sail, me hearties, as we continue our voyage through the history of the Tripoli Tan War. Chapter 4, Renewed Conflict, The Second Barbary War Ahoy there, me hearties! In our last chapter, we explored the First Barbary War, including the famous battles of the USS Philadelphia and the USS Enterprise. In this chapter, we'll dive into the renewed conflict with the Barbary states in the Second Barbary War. After the conclusion of the First War, Piracy in the Mediterranean continued to be a problem for American shipping, with the North African states increasing their demands for tribute and attacking American vessels with greater frequency. In 1807, the United States passed the Embargo Act, which prohibited American ships from engaging in trade with foreign nations. 
The embargo was intended to protect American interests by depriving the Barbary states of the revenue they earned from tribute and piracy, but it proved to be an ineffective solution to the problem. In 1815, after the conclusion of the War of 1812 with Britain, the United States resumed its efforts to combat piracy in the Mediterranean. The Second Barbary War was prompted by the continued attacks on American shipping by the Algerian state, which had refused to sign a treaty with the United States following the conclusion of the First War. Under the command of Commodore Stephen Decatur, the U.S. Navy launched a series of attacks against the Algerian fleet, including a daring raid on the city of Algiers in 1815. The raid, which involved the burning of several Algerian warships and the destruction of the city's harbor defenses, was a resounding success and earned Decatur widespread acclaim. The Second Barbary War was relatively short-lived, with the Algerians agreeing to a treaty with the United States in 1816. The terms of the treaty included the release of American prisoners and the cessation of tribute payments from the United States to Algeria. The Second Barbary War marked the end of the Barbary piracy crisis and demonstrated the growing power and influence of the United States on the world stage. However, piracy remained a problem in other parts of the world, and the U.S. Navy would continue to play a role in combating piracy and protecting American interests in the years to come. As we wrap up our journey through the history of the Tripoli Tan War, we can look back on the conflict as a pivotal moment in American history when the young nation was forced to confront the challenges of engaging with the wider world and protecting its interests beyond its own shores. So let's raise a toast to the sailors and leaders who made it all possible and set sail for new adventures on the high seas. Chapter 5 Aftermath and Legacy is America's Fight Against Piracy in the Early Republic Welcome back, shipmates. In our previous chapters, we explored the history of the Tripoli Tan War and the United States efforts to combat piracy in the Mediterranean. In this final chapter, we'll explore the aftermath of the conflict and its legacy on American foreign policy. The Tripoli Tan War marked a turning point in American history, as it was one of the first times the young nation had engaged in a conflict beyond its own borders. The war demonstrated the United States' growing military and diplomatic power on the world stage and established the U.S. Navy as a formidable force in international waters. In the years following the Tripoli Tan War, the United States continued to engage in conflicts with foreign powers, including the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War. The experiences gained during these conflicts helped to shape American foreign policy and military strategy in the years to come. One of the most significant legacies of the Tripoli Tan War was the establishment of the U.S. Navy as a permanent force in American military operations. Prior to the war, the United States had a relatively small navy and relied largely on privateers and other non-governmental vessels for maritime defense. However, the success of the U.S. Navy in the Tripoli Tan War demonstrated the importance of a strong naval presence and led to the construction of more advanced ships and the expansion of the Navy's role in American foreign policy. The Tripoli Tan War also helped to shape American attitudes towards diplomacy and foreign relations. The conflict demonstrated the limitations of diplomacy in dealing with hostile powers and underscored the importance of military force in protecting American interests abroad. This perspective would continue to influence American foreign policy in the years to come, particularly during the Cold War era. In addition to its impact on American foreign policy, the Tripoli Tan War also had a lasting cultural impact. The conflict inspired numerous works of literature and art, including the famous hymn from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, which commemorates the U.S. Marines' involvement in the war. As we reflect on the legacy of the Tripoli Tan War, we can see how this conflict helped to shape the course of American history in the years to come. The war demonstrated the United States' growing military and diplomatic power and established the U.S. Navy as a permanent force in American military operations. The lessons learned during the war would continue to influence American foreign policy and military strategy for generations to come. Thank you for watching our story. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss out on our next video.